the panel discussion was great. Um, really picked up on a lot of interesting things that the uh, the speakers had uh, had teed up. So that was great, and I hope that kind of discussion continues. Now, of course, genomics is a powerful way to learn about individuals, right? It is the essence, uh, at least biologically, of who we are. Um, um, and of course, that data can be aggregated into large databases to learn a lot about populations. And uh, that combined with uh, clinical data uh, forms the basis of, of records of, that help physicians and he other health care providers make decisions. And it's imperative that we, um, that we have access to this data uh, in, in, in appropriate ways to make appropriate decisions about uh, diagnosis and treatment. So, as I said in my opening remarks, that um, bioethics here intersects genomics and uh, this notion of and healthcare reform uh, because bioethics is important to understanding uh, to, to working through some of these important issues in genomics. And it's also an issue about uh, that we have a moral obligation to uh, improve the quality of our care. And for the last um, and, 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 and that there are many ethical issues that are related to that. For the last, actually, seven or eight years, the Institute of Medicine has been embarking on a, uh, on a concept, concept of a learning healthcare system, that is, as a strategy to improve quality at uh, you know, at lower cost, uh, we need to transform uh, our current way of, of doing business into, in, in particularly in, in, in systems approaches, to maximize our ability to continuously learn and improve. So we're going to talk in uh, this next uh, part of the conference on this notion of uh, of comparative effectiveness research, how that informs how we learn about populations and how we learn about people, the uh, medical records, big data, and how this all, what this all means, and what questions we should be asking about how we are improving the system and how we're required to improve the system. I would just point out that, you know, currently we would think that we would go from basic science advances to uh, evaluating those advances to evidence that uh, of an effectiveness of an intervention that provides a standard of care and a good patient experience. And of course, this is in theory what should happen, but there's erosion uh, of uh, these, uh, these big goals along the line that we have basic science advances, but the insights are poorly managed. Uh, we do have evidence, but we've got lots of data that evidence is poorly used by clinicians. Um, we have uh, lots of care experiences, but the care is that those experiences, particularly in aggregate, are poorly captured. And uh, so that there's tremendous, throughout our whole kind of system of care, there are tremendous missed opportunities, waste, and I would indeed say even harm. So, again, the Institute of Medicine, NIH, and others have been talking about, okay, so how do we, what do we do about this? How do we create um, uh, what has been come to be known a learning healthcare system? And this would be defined as a, as a system in which science, informatics, incentives, and culture are aligned for continuous quality improvement which we embed best practices into, uh, uh, into a delivery process and, and, um, and that we capture new knowledge and continuously feed back this new knowledge for improved care and care delivery. And as I've said a couple of times now, I think we, there really is a sense that we have a moral imperative to think in this way. Uh, because to Im improve quality reduces harm 
and actually I think we have an imperative to steward precious resources. Uh, we, uh, what does our health care budget consume now? Uh, well, we don't have a health care budget, which is one of the problems, but our health care expenditures consumes, what, close to 22% of GDP, or 17% of GDP, $2.3 trillion is a figure I've heard, tremendous amount of resources, and we have an immoral imperative to steward those resources to, to work in a most efficient uh, um, um, and highest quality system possible. Uh, now, uh, other speakers coming forward, particularly Dr. Hoffman, is going to talk about uh, his experiences with handling uh, databases and uh, incorporating those in the electronic medical record. And the electronic health record has become really, a, obviously, a key factor in, um, in operationalizing and in, in how we would capture data, act on that data, and learn from that data. And so we basically capture information from patients and taking histories and physical examinations and I would want to say the story of the illness, which is critical. <laughs> uh, we get laboratory data and we uh, combine that data and we get some kind of information. But I want to challenge us to think about as we talk about health information and electronic medical record is what is the information that we really want in health information and technology? And are we actually always capturing the kinds of information about individual patients that would actually optimize and customize our care for individual patients? Uh, we capture a lot of data, but uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested in how we are thinking about capturing uh, the uh, um, qualitative uh, experiences of people, the, the, and, and as I said earlier, the narrative of their illness, because that's so critical, I think, to understanding values of the patient that should inform shared decision making uh, between patient and provider. Uh, Sir William Osler actually said this a long time ago, listen to your patient he is telling you the diagnosis. So I want to ask our health IT people um, who, um, uh, you know, what, how are we listening? How are you understanding how we're listening to patients as we're capturing data in electronic medical records? Now, so that's one aspect. And, and clearly EHRs are critical to, as a, they're a linchpin, really, of, uh, of, the, uh, of, of, of how we will operationalize a system that it continuously learns and improves. There's another issue, which is, uh, I also alluded to, is that we will continuously blur these distinctions between what we call routine medical care and what we call research. Now currently, we have very different frameworks and kind of standards for how, uh, how we kind of uh, regulate and oversee standard care, routine practice, and research here as expressed as clinical trials. And this is just supposed to represent that we have a high level of regulatory oversight of things that we see as research, like clinical trials, but a low level of kind of regulatory oversight for what is routine care. And as John Lantos and others have made, and I have made in the past, that, you know, this is, uh, this is, uh, we get into trouble, I think, if we continue to think this way, because there's clearly some research, which is minimal risk, low burden, that we are perhaps overprotective thing people from, and actually that then compromises our ability to learn. And there's clearly a lot of non-evidence-based routine care, which subjects patients to significant risk, which we don't regulate at all. Uh, and to me, the best example of this is uh, in the field of pain management. Uh, uh, there's actually very little data, for example, that epidural steroid injections for low back pain actually cause, uh, actually are efficacious, certainly in the long run. Yet there's very little kind of oversight of, of, 
of when that's done in a pain clinic. And, and, and you may be aware that uh, there have been several deaths now from uh, uh, patients getting contaminated epidural steroids, uh, getting fungal meningitis, and, uh, and deaths. And, and, and I dare say, as I've looked at some of those uh, cases, um, you know, I don't think any of those patients should have even gotten epidural steroids, but yet there's no, but yet if that had been done as a clinical trial, the irony is, of course, if that had been done as a clinical trial, there would have been much more oversight of this, and, um, and uh, perhaps these patients wouldn't be harmed. So I'm saying we, we, we have this imbalance here, and, um, and I think as we think about how our system needs to be transformed to a continuous quality improvement machine, if I could make that phrase, we need to talk about what are the appropriate ethical review and oversight structures that puts this in more balance. And uh, I know uh, Sarah uh, will talk a little more about that and other, and, uh, and other speakers will talk about that. But I think that there are, um, that, uh, that we need to, but, but it is also true that this is a, uh, as particularly as we talk about the specific issue of comparative effectiveness research, which is uh, and, and outcomes-based research, which are important components to contributing to what, uh, how a system continuously improves and learns. There is not a lot, I mean, there is a, <laughs> there uh, is uh, a lack of consensus, particularly in the bioethics community, about what the standards should be of, around ethical oversight for this kind of research. Um, we clearly um, um, need, can define outcomes-based research that might be low risk and low burden to the patients and thus might be exempt from the usual kind of IRB review mechanisms or at least expedite, are, are being allowed with expedited reviews. Um, but um, the devil is in the details. And uh, for example, uh, um, we know in the case of the famous or infamous support study, right, which, in, which, which was this study in neonates, neonates in intensive care units to try to understand what is the optimal level of oxygen to deliver to these neonates. Uh, there was a range of, uh, of oxygen levels that are given in routine clinical practice from a, from a high end of 95% to a low end of about 87% of oxygen. Um, and, but we know that if, the, that if an individual patient, there was too low an oxygen dose given, that the, it, the infant was a greater risk of dying. At too high a dose of oxygen delivery, there were issues related to blindness and lung disease. So there was, but there was this state kind of a clinical equipoise in that we really didn't know what the optimal level of oxygen delivery was. And so research, a comparative effectiveness kind of trial was done in which children were randomized to low and high ends of the, of the uh, oxygen um, um, ranges. And, uh, and the study was done. And, and actually, there was a lot, this generated a lot of criticism because uh, the Office for Human Research Protection actually found, uh, made a finding that the investigators in the support study uh, and the University of Alabama at Birmingham were the lead investigators, they found that they had not properly informed, um, or at least that was their interpretation, they had not properly informed the parents of the risk inherent in this, uh, in this comparative effectiveness research study, although um, the range of oxygen that could be delivered to these children was all within the range that were usually given in routine clinical care. And there was a set of bioethicists who said the uh, OHP PAR was wrong in, in issuing this reprimand, and there was a set of bioethicists that said the OHP PAR was right. And um, I only point this out because um, I think that uh, as was pointed out in the editorial of the New England Journal by Jeff Drazen and others, that 
uh, there, there are really important issues here because comparative effective research studies like this are critical to advancing how we improve routine care, providing the uh, strong evidentiary base for moving forward. And although uh, IRBs and, and regulatory oversight uh, uh, boards and committees absolutely have a responsibility to protect vulnerable patients, they also have a responsibility to make sure that we can facilitate the kinds of research and quality improvement activities that are going to allow the system to continuously improve and learn. So this is, this is a, a, a source of debate and concern. So we have the situation where we need to transform from a system in which we have high variability and quality. Uh, uh, almost everyone agrees that we're we're spending a lot of money on health care, but that we're probably not getting our money's worth. And, uh, and we have all these missed opportunities and waste and harm. And ideally, we need to get to an environment where we are, in fact, seamlessly going from medical advances to evidence to improve care, embed that in the, and to in best practices to improve the patient experience. And that means learning from every patient encounter once we've, uh, as, a, as a part of this, this engine of quality improvement. So that kind of sets the stage for how I kind of see conceptually a learning healthcare system. Others will come and talk about uh, uh, some specifics of this and how outcomes research and comparative effectiveness research uh, fits into this and what the particular um, um, research ethical issues are and what some of the barriers uh, are to uh, doing uh, these kinds of critical studies more efficiently are. So with that said, I'd like to now move to the next speaker.